Hello. Hi. How are you? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Not too bad. I was um, I was just watching back the video that we uh, that we recorded oh, yeah. um the other week actually. So just some just some interesting stuff in there. You you know the you know the Bamzuki guys, don't you? Oh, I thought. Yeah. 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 I do. Well, I mean, there's no reason why we can't talk about. Hi. How's it going? How's it, how's your week going? But. I mean, I thought you called me because you love me and you wanted to have a chat, Callum. That's all I'm saying. And it turns out you're just trying to access my LinkedIn. Yeah. I mean, that too. But there's no reason why we can't do both, isn't there? Well, I tell you what, it'd be great to catch up with them. I don't know what they're all up to and what they all look like at the moment. So uh, yeah, maybe I'll try and... Yeah, give them a call. Give them a send them all a right, message. I'll take them out. Uh, okay, so the, the guys uh, I think you should talk to is uh, Paul Tyler. He pretty much invented it. Right. Uh, then there's Ian and Dylan, Ian Saunter and Dylan Benet's um, geniuses, both of them. And, uh, oh, and Jeremy, we should get Jeremy Cook in as well, who um, salvaged the company. That, 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 Sounds good that, to me. All right, uh, let me just call them up. Hang on. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Thanks for bringing everyone in, Dad. <laughs> Well, I mean, since you're all here, um, I, I, I mean, I've got a few questions uh, to ask, I guess. Um, number one is really, I mean, how did Bamzuki even begin? What was the sort of process? What, who started it off, I guess? That's got to be a pool question. Isn't well, it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it all comes from a, a, a small provincial town in Holland, basically. Uh, so back in uh, January 1999, uh, I was working at the BBC and uh, I was sent uh, on a course. Uh, it was called um, Concepts in New Media and it was run by, um, it was being run by a sort of a, a, media, a media development house in Hilversum, which is the sort of the, the, the Hollywood of, of Holland, uh, although it's a small little provincial town, but it is the media capital. And um, I was sent there with a guy called Jeremy Daldry, and we both went on this course. It was a sort of I don't know, six module course that was going to span about nine months. And the idea was, was we were supposed to develop a, a concept that was going to then um, uh, try and work within this sort of new territory. The BBC was obsessed at the time about this idea that back in 1999, remember this is like, what, I don't know, four or five years before Facebook, uh, that it, it had to get into the digital space. Uh, it had to get into um, something that was between TV and the internet or what have you. And uh, so it was sending people like me on courses to go and try and work it out. <laughs> and um, we were one of the one of the guest uh, mentors speakers was a fantastic guy called Frank Alsimer, who you should look him up. He's an amazing guy. He's doing incredible things um, with We and Poo in Amsterdam um, and recycled housing. Anyway, he um, he showed us this incredible clip uh, by a guy called Carl Sims, who'd been working at um, uh, IBM and Thinking Machines Corporation back in the early 90s, I think, back in 94. And he'd been working on these uh, evolutionary algorithms and and sort of visualizing them in a, in a very beautiful way. And I was just hypnotized by this. I thought it was the most incredible thing. And um, and it was the first time I'd actually seen something that was sort of computer generated, but didn't seem procedurally animated. It just had this life of its own. And, and, and I could suddenly see the bridge into something that was televisual rather than it being something that you sort of acted on as like a computer where you like a computer game where you had this one-to-one -one interaction i felt that it was a it was a lean back experience you could just sit back and watch this thing and uh, so uh german and i got very excited about this and then um uh, i went off and he he had to go off and do other things and didn't attend the rest of the workshops because i think he was busy doing other programs but i then pursued the idea and and just started developing it and developing and developing it and um, yeah, that's the. I mean, I won't tell the whole story because I'm Didn't sure you, I, I think you told me at one point that you thought you could maybe make wildlife programs with artificial life forms. Was that yeah, like, well, that was filming what they were doing? This? Yeah, yeah. So, so what was what was it? The, there was so I suppose two things at the essence of it. One was this idea that you could um, that the that an evolutionary 
because the Carl Sims stuff was based on these e evolutionary algorithms, the idea that you would design a small creature that would get from A to B, and uh, and it would do it very badly, but you would then multiply it many, many times, and through a sort of Darwinian principle, it would basically then you would alter the design of these blocks, building blocks, and those that were the, the, the offspring that were better at getting from A to B, or more likely to get from A to B, were kept, and the parents were thrown away. And you do this millions and millions and millions of times until eventually you got some sort of weird object that had sort of evolved to get from A to B. And um, and by doing that, it just the outcome was just beautiful. And so we thought, well, wouldn't it be amazing if the audience could somehow get involved in designing aspects of that, but at the same time there was an evolutionary component, and that maybe these things sort of then had this sort of mass effect where they sort of lived in a big world. So we had this sort of notion of a huge world where these things could live and then a small kind of space arena where maybe you could sort of bring these in and let them compete in somehow uh, way. And that was, I suppose, the essence of, yeah, this, that's right, Mike. There were these sort of two aspects to it, which actually, funny enough, as we talk about the, the evolution of the TV series and the working with various different partners, we actually then ended up working in kind of the more tighter, smaller space. And we abandoned the evolutionary world because it was just, well, it was just too expensive and too difficult. But um, that's maybe for a conversation later in this uh, in this chat is that how you met creature labs yeah it was actually because what happened was so, so god it's a lot of stuff here so so basically um i started developing this idea on the various workshops and at the same time the bbc uh, uh, came up with a new department called bbc imagineering and, and it had about four million pounds to just um, uh, splash it against the wall. What's the expression uh, on splash. projects? It's, that's it. Uh, on on new projects and um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a hilarious story uh, which I just told my girlfriend this morning, which I hope I can include it. Which is that so so Jeremy left the the, the work, Jeremy uh, Daudry, not Jeremy that's here. Was um, he, he he didn't attend the rest of the workshops. But Mark Goodchild did. So Mark and I, who's also a former colleague of mine at the BBC. We worked together and we started developing this thing over the various different modules. And um, there was this new department set up called BBC Imagineering, had four million pounds to spend on development. And we thought, great, we want some of that money. So we went to go and apply to, 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 to try and put this project that we were developing into their pot. And we were sort of told, well, you've already got money from somewhere else. You shouldn't really be doing this. And I was like, no, no, come on, we should be able to do this. So they invited us to a meeting where we were going to go and pitch the project. The most hilarious thing is, is that we were sat in a corridor. We arrived a bit early, I don't know, in Bush House or something. We were sitting in a corridor and um, all the sort of board members of BBC Imagineering all turned up Got a, um, and walked in this corridor, very senior people, sort of Ashley Highfield, head of the media thing, and very some senior people, walked into the corridor and sort of bundled us up with them, took us into this meeting room, and they discussed the whole BBC Imagineering and all the money and how they were going to allocate the funds. And then they said, right, we should now, let's see the first people who are going to pitch. Uh, <laughs> I believe it's uh, Paul Taylor and Mark Goodchild. And we were like, oh, we're, we're here. Hello. And what had happened was we got sucked into a pre-meeting, which was their first ever meeting to get together. So maybe that's the reason why we got the money. But anyway, they liked the idea. And then what happened was uh, a woman called Fiona McKenzie took over BBC Imaginary. I mean, took over. She was appointed as the creative lead of that. And um, she basically said, you know, they sort of said, right, you need to go out and you need to make this. How are you going to make it work? And I said, well, we probably need to go to tender. We don't have the expertise. So I've been doing a huge amount of research uh, of, of various different companies. And I felt like there was either two types of companies that should get involved. Big, meaty, heavy companies. So we invited people like Microsoft, IBM, Hewlett Packard, and games companies. And we invited, oh, you guys might remember, I think it was a company called Rage, was it, from Liverpool? And there was a company called Creature Labs because I'd been enamored by their incredible work in evolutionary, uh, oh, no, in artificial intelligence. Uh, remember, this is, again, 99, 2000. So we, we invited 11 companies together. And I remember the basement of the television center. I was just this junior little assistant producer guy thinking, what the hell am I doing? But suddenly I had all these very important people, including Ian Saunter, correct? You were there, weren't you? And a guy called Chris McKee, who was the then CEO of Creature Labs. Yeah. Dylan, you weren't there, were you? No, I, I wasn't. You no. So I had all these big wigs. And um, I mean, maybe Ian can fill in here because I then get presented this huge ambitious project of a huge world where you'd have these evolutionary creatures. And we showed the Carl Sims video and, uh, and I presented this whole idea that we'd have this huge world, these things would all mate and then people would own them and they would kind of develop them and there would be evolution. And then eventually we'd bring them together into a studio and we'd let these things compete. And uh, yeah, Ian, you remember that day? 
I very well remember it. There was myself, Chris, and Lisa DiRuggio from Creature Labs. There were all these guys from Microsoft and Oracle and the rest. You did a really good pitch. In fact, you had some video material, sort of, and you even had a name for the project, Evo Warriors. Correct. I think it was. And um, we left thinking, wow, we've got to be involved. But we, we thought, we, we did feel a bit small, actually. And we had no idea that you were some sort of young, naive, kind of, <laughs> didn't know what they were doing, <laughs> budding producer type. We thought that you were kind of somehow in charge. So, um, yeah, we left and I got a call the following day from a guy called Dave Cliff at Hewlett Packard <laughs> saying, are you guys going to pitch for this? Um, and I think I'd been back and reported to well, I would have reported to a guy called Toby Simpson, who basically ran the Creatures Development at Creature Labs, that series, and Dylan, who was in charge of our Artificial Organisms group, uh, AOG, which numbered about 18 strength at that time. And the feedback was very positive. But when I got this call from Dave Cliff, I had no idea actually what the corporate line was going to be and I said something like well yeah I think we are why are you and he said well we're thinking about it yeah if you're going to do it then 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 we should maybe talk about doing it together so I said fine and then we had to sort of scramble um, and um, then Dylan myself probably Toby maybe someone else disappeared off down to a meeting at HP in just outside Bristol, where we re-met with Paul and Mark Goodchild um, and this enormous team that uh, HP had put together. <laughs> and we had to sort of play party games and try and introduce ourselves with sort of... <laughs> Corporate uh, nonsense. Corporate nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, sorry, Paul. Out. I'm not. I'm not dissing your current career, obviously. <laughs> well, there is a little, there's a little anecdote here, actually, which Dylan will remember. One of the one of these party games was you had to say something that you did for a for interest, a hobby, um, and you had to work out who it was who was lying about their hobby. And I seem to recall that. Dylan suggested that he was interested in cultivating bonsai trees. Um, is that right, <coughs> Dylan? I think you probably, you're looking like you don't remember this, but anyway. My memory is really poor, but uh, that's that's quite plausible because, because uh, that was actually true, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think it was true. And hence, we, we actually called the engine that we developed the whole of the subsequent uh, code upon bonsai, the bonsai engine. I didn't realise that. That's nice. Yeah. I like that. Just, <laughs> in, just before um, that, that pitch process, what what was the work that Creature Labs were doing? What what games were you actually producing at that? Uh, well, we were working on. We just released Creatures Two. We were working on a product called Creatures Adventures, which was a sort of youth skewing. Um, for, the, for the audience that's sort of Callum's age and below, what was Creatures? Uh, it was, uh, I suppose, it was a virtual pet uh, that lived in, or a whole series of them actually, that lived in a virtual world, a 2D virtual world, designed and developed originally by uh, Stephen Grand, who was sort of... Yeah. It was, it... <laughs> I thought you were going to get Dawkins then. <laughs> He's in the cupboard. Oh, speaking of which, I do actually have a copy of the original boxed product for oh, wow. Uh, published by Warner from, Brothers. And from this collector, it's a very yeah. strange sort of box design that didn't fit very well. But anyway, someone here. Like, oh, Richard Dawkins, Oxford University zoologist and author, quote, call it a game if you like. But this is the most impressive example of artificial life I have seen. Wow. And then underneath that is a quote from Douglas Adams. Oh my word. Guy. I first saw this program in the same week that evidence was discovered of life on Mars. This is more exciting. Wow. 
That is high praise indeed. Yeah, that's a hitchhiker. So yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was very successful. We sold well over a million units of that first um, product, and then we went on to release this two creatures, three and creatures docking station, and creatures playground and creatures adventures. So it was, it was pretty, pretty, pretty successful. But Dylan, say a bit more about what what you were up to and where you got involved. With all of that so um, yeah so we'd started um, in the uh, artificial organisms group basically looking at sort of the next technology um, to incorporate in the new new games so I mean one of the one of the uh, things sort of on the horizons was an idea of having creatures 3d which would be by taking creatures into a, a much more rich environment 3d environment with physics and um, and a lot uh, sort of uh, richer interactions between the uh, the agents and and the world and alongside that so uh, as part of that we were looking at um, uh, physics simulations and, uh, and simulating um, articulated uh, bodies of little creatures sort of Carl Sims type um, structures and um, we had that uh, we have a version of that that um, uh, we had running as a sort of screensaver on our computers in the lab and basically when the screensaver kicked in a little funny creature would plop onto your de onto your onto your screen and it would like lollop along a bit and then it would get destroyed and it would get a score for how far it travelled and then I'd go back off to the central server and then we had this population where we would then take all the good ones create offspring for those and we'd take them and then send them back out to people's screensavers to be evaluated um and um it uh, so so we'd already started working in this sort of space so when when um, paul sort of came to us with this uh, idea and the need to sort of simulate physics and articulated creatures we were, we were thinking this is really cool we can we can work in this sort of area um but the um the the sort of the bigger scary side was running a server with uh, I think they wanted a, a million agents <laughs> running live, was it? I think the idea think was... A if... million agents and two million pounds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we probably two shouldn't go... We shouldn't head towards <laughs> the money arguments. <laughs> I mean, it really was. I mean... Uh, but it was a period, I, as I recall, uh, it was a period where certainly the BBC were throwing the most money at anything like this. But also it was a time, I think, t in technology terms, where we felt well, we could probably do that with enough beef, with enough money and enough HPs involved in this. The idea that Hewlett-Packard might get involved in making a kids' television show, you know, that was easy to well, do. Just, uh, fun, funnily enough, actually, Mike, though, that, and it's, it's not a huge important distinction, but actually, even though I was coming out of children's at the time, this project, it kind of, it, it, it sort of, it, um, it's, it, it, created its own momentum and before long we weren't pitching it as a children's proposition we were actually pitching it as a as a bbc2 offering because we'd heard on the grapevine that jane root who was then controller of bbc2 was looking for a replacement for robot wars and therefore we saw that as like an opportunity which you probably did with fightbox later on um, yeah. we saw that as an opportunity for us to actually pitch something that was far bigger because even though i was this very young um, um late 20 something um maybe even 30, I can't remember that, uh, assistant producer at the time, um, we just thought, well, let's let's really go for it because people just seem to be very excited by it, particularly this sort of youthful aspect, sort of sort of idiots like us just coming along with good ideas and and and, and creating these sort of weird connections into into domains that the BBC yeah. wasn't used to having relationships with, which gaming companies, uh, big back-end uh, server companies or printers or whatever they were, Hewlett Packard, etc. So suddenly, I mean, I know people talk about the Wild West. I don't mean that's not the right expression, but it just felt like this sort of crazy space. A anything so when, was possible. Yeah, we were. Well, and, and, and I, I, know I mean, we you know, we got the poison chalice of trying to replace Robot Wars, basically, and, <laughs> and exactly. the Simpsons. So you lucked out in a way because you at least got recognition, basically. <laughs> Wow. But I mean, you talk about the money, though. I mean, the funny thing is, just to say, though, that, that what happened was, and it was nearly the death, uh, is it the expression, the death knoll, which was that actually when Hewlett Packard, with their sort of, um, how would you describe yourself, Ian, as a sort of sub partner, because you were sort of like a sort of a, it was Hewlett Packard. Oh, we, were, we, we were the subcontractor, they were the prime contractor. Yeah. Exactly. Because yeah. I'd heard 
that BBC Imagineering was only going to fund to the tune of, and I can't remember, it was either 150,000 or 400,000 max per project. So I kind of almost just hands in the air and just gave up and just thought, I mean, this is probably about almost a year after I'd come up with the idea. So probably about circa 2000, I think. And I thought, well, this is just not going to happen. Fiona actually turned around and said, you know what? I think I could spend a quarter of my budget on this. So she used a quarter of her budget to fund this project. And BBC Imagineering was set up to spread, you know, its goodness across the BBC. And we were basically taking, because she said, I think we can do this. And that's like a million pounds. I was like, I'd just been working on Blue Peter where I'd been trying to get 5,000 pounds for, for some something on some show. And I was just totally not allowed. Suddenly I'm looking for a million and people are going, yeah, I think, I think we can, I think we can find that money for you, Paul, you know. <laughs> That's testament to the quality of the idea, I think. They, they did. They actually pulled that money away from Fightbox, I seem to remember. They <laughs> had to go <laughs> and find it from somewhere else. <laughs> there was definitely an overlap going on there. And um, I remember seeing Fightbox and actually being quite depressed because I, I, I can't quite remember the timeline, but I figured that that was, that was definitely curtains for um, Evo Warriors, as it was. Someone in the, um, someone in the Discord actually mentioned um, the because uh, they were aware of it being called evo worries at the beginning and they were wondering uh what the differences between evo worries were as a pitch when it um initially sort of came about and how that became bamzuki and what the if there are any differences between them or whether it was just a rebranding or anything along those That's lines huge difference massive, so it difference, goes... massive difference but i just want to just drop drop in one little thing which i probably shouldn't say uh but <laughs> Um, and, it, and it's this, that with the demise of the Evo Warriors prospect and the million pounds or plus whatever it was that might have fallen in our direction the Creature Labs from it, alongside a couple of other rather unfortunate, badly timed things that happened, actually the end of Evo Warriors as a prospect was also the end of Creature Labs as a going concern. Right. And um, at, the, at that particular point, we'd struggled for months to, to, to keep things uh, ticking over. <clears throat> we finally failed to do that. And the office was empty. And I was the last man in the room to sort of I actually had a sort of free desk there for some months. Um, and um, I'd managed to sort of maintain contact or even work with just a few people, including Dylan. And we were kind of kicking around wondering what on earth we were going to do with our lives now that the whole rug had been pulled from under us. And then I got a phone call in my empty office uh, from, from Paul, who basically said, um, look, I've got an idea whereby we could... Are you still around, basically? <laughs> I said, no, we're not. He said, well, could we do it anyway? Um, and uh, I almost, oh, I got very excited and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyway, Paul had had an idea that he'd tried out on his kitchen table the night before. Go on, Paul. Well, look, I think just for the sake of the viewers, it would be worth just clarifying a slight time because what happened was we, we got that million pounds for Imagineering. We, we spent that money with Hewlett Packard and Creature Labs as a subcontractor. They came up with this enormous project, which, which I felt very uh, uh, immature in terms of handling, but, but it, because I didn't know how to project manage a project like that, we have project managers in and everything, and it was all going, and it was all going according to plan, but it was their plan. And it wasn't very iterative, it wasn't very agile, it was just this, they'd scoped it out and it just, Turn out, and it was amazing at the end. But it wasn't—you couldn't then produce a TV show from it. It just—it did what it said, which was a proof of concept. But the problem was, well, so it was just too big. And I think they came back with a price tag of like nine million or something like that, a huge amount of money to make the TV show. And and that was what was happening was in the in the parallel was obviously Fightbox was going on, and I, I didn't know anything about that until um, until I went to Worldwide, BBC Worldwide, the commercial division of the BBC the arm, and and. And basically they said, I'm sorry, Paul, we're not going to fund your project. They had been really interested, but we're not going to fund it. And we're going to fund something else. And I, 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 think, I, I think I remember crying as I walked down Wood Lane back towards the television centre, thinking, 
Oh, this is this is it. This is where I should probably leave the room. This yeah. is exactly right. <laughs> Sodding my dicks, whoever he is. Um, so what happened was 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 interesting enough was actually in a way um, that that uh, I went away and just thought right, sod it, it's not going to happen. You just have to get on with your life. And I went back and struck a deal with the BBC that I could go and get trained as a studio director because that's what I really wanted to do. And just but uh, but but Eva Warrior's behind me, even though we just spent like I just spent about two or three years of my life on it, you know, and it really was my life. And um, I remember them being on a holiday in Sardinia with my then uh, girlfriend uh, and mother of my two children. Um, and uh, she was pregnant with our, f uh, our, um, our firstborn, who's now 17. And, um, and I remember thinking, hold on a second here. Hewlett Packard, basically, from the research labs, had worked on the entire universe with this incredible evolving universe, landscape, very expensive terrains and things going around in it and mating and crossbreeding and stuff. But Creature Labs had been working on this incredible sort of uh, sort of hi-fi um, uh, simulation uh, the, uh, and, and those articulated creatures sort of running around. And I thought, well, why don't we just get rid of the HP part and, and keep the, the lo-fi part and keep the hi-fi part? And why don't we turn that into a, a kid's show? So I went back and actually it wasn't my, I don't think it was my uh, my kitchen. I might have done it on the kitchen, but what I did is I was, I was directing at the point at a kid's show called Exchange. Basically what I did, I went in one early morning into the studio, about seven in the morning. I, I moved the cameras, which you're not allowed supposed to do, but I moved them into position. I took my own laptop, I plugged it into the desk and I did a simple overlay with creatures running around on the exchange counter. And, um, and I, I, I got something to record it and put it onto tape. And it was a massive lesson for me, which was that if you want to prove anything, you need to show it. And I just, and I just happened to be in a meeting with my boss, um, and we just talked about stuff. And I said, "Hey, Anne, this is Anne Gilchrist, who is an executive producer within Children's." And I said, "Hey, do you, do you want to take a look at this? I, I don't know why. I just, I just did it because you know it's still in my heart, and you know." And I put it the VHS into the machine and played it, and she was like, "We have to show Dot this now." Dot being Dorothy Pryor, who was the head of Children's BBC. Now, the interesting thing about Children's, B Children's BBC department is they're a production unit, but also a self-commissioning unit. So they can self-commission their own programs. So we we literally went up, I think, there and then, and we knocked on the door and and said, "Look, Dot, you have to see this." And we put the tape in the machine, and Dot said, "We have to make this happen." So all this time, you know, where I couldn't get a commission, I couldn't get the funding, and so that's then led to the phone call. Uh, oh, I get shivers in my back, and then led <laughs> to me contacting Ian. But what I will say is that one of the, my lessons in life is is we learned at the BBC this expression duty of care, where you always have to look after the you know that you always have to look after your people you're working with. But I think that through my naivety and my passion for the project, I, I let go of my duty of care because I should have been much kinder to, to Creature Labs and sort of say, guys, you know, like a, like a, a bad relationship, this has to end, you know. But I kept on sort of feeding and saying. Well, you never know, and it might, and it'll be lovely. And wouldn't it be great? So poor, you know, I was still getting a salary, and these poor guys were like living off, you know, breadcrumbs from Cambridge. You know, it's, it, I mean, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a tangent, but I think at that time there was like this period where there was lots of money being dangled in front of this industry, the, the newly forming interactive industry. But there were lots of companies going bust by the wayside, of that, trying to survive the process staying in there because you and Packer are very used to spending two years pitching for a massive gig they don't win because they've got resources to do that but I think small games companies and like with us um, sort of internet developers we were regarded in the same light as Hewlett Packard because we were tech we lost two game companies in the fight box process they were pretty much driven that way by the process of hanging on for two years to try and develop these methods yeah which is a sad thing about that time, and I think it maybe might have been what part of what killed. You know, we would. I was saying to Callum the other day there was uh, there was another show, Armchair uh, Commander, or, uh, oh, yes. which is based on the Total War engine uh, that Lion TV made, and I think we're going to try and make one of these about that as well, because there, in that period there was a lot of shows like this in development. That was a good show. I enjoyed it was that. A good show. Yeah. I, I like yeah. that as well. Yeah. It's yeah. funny how I look back at all of the shows that we've been involved in and think, Jesus, they, we should bring all of those back now we've got the technology we've got. That's the other make, thing, yeah. You can make them on a bloody mobile phone, basically. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't need any of, the, any of the shit we were buying. To do. I mean, yeah, I imagine that's another thing, actually. That, um, something that came up a lot in the Discord as well is that um, with today's modern technology, if you were to say, if this whole process were to begin again, say, today, 
how do you think Bamzuki would look differently? Do you think that there would be anything that would have changed if it was happening now with the technology at our disposal? What do you think that would have, how would that have impacted the process, do you think? Dylan? Mm. You're probably best at Dylan should probably um, explain where he's working now, I think, before we... Um, I might be good well, for the audience, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then he can explain well, why, why he's got that beard. After. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, well, I'm now, I'm now working at DeepMind, um, which is um, part of Google, um, and um, uh, actually uh, working with um, um, some sort of virtual creature-y type stuff there as well. So um, last year, in fact, I, I published a paper which had like a, a Zook type creature, which was learning to play sumo. Um, and uh, we were evolving the body of the creature while it was at the same time learning how to sumo wrestle another creature. So there's a, there's a lot of interest in, uh, in um, sort of like AI and robotics and, and autonomy. Um, but it's still, um, it, we're still, I think, a, a far, quite far off being able to do that sort of like at home uh, to train a creature from scratch to be able to move around and fight. Um, so it's still really impressive when you see the creatures in, um, in Banzuki running around and, and doing what they do. And quite a few people sort of like see those and go, wow, that's like amazing controllers you've got there and how did you do it? And I have to explain, well, actually it's really quite simple. And um, the control in those <laughs> things, they're like, um, there's uh, these uh, uh, things called the Brat Brattenberg uh, vehicles, which is like a concept <laughs> Uh, which is basically uh, like a little motorized vehicle and uh, you can get sort of intelligent behavior out of them by simply wiring the motors and the light sensors um, differently between the, uh, if you've got two different light sensors at the front, um, if you cross wire them, then basically what happens is if light's shining bright on one side, then the motor on the opposite side goes faster and it turns towards the light. And then if it goes too far, then the other motor starts turning fast because of like the other one. And you get this um, this little robot that will then run across the floor and follow a light. Or if you wire the, the motor and the light sensors the other way around, then it will avoid light and hide. So just using that very same, same principle, we, we had those in the creatures um, and we changed the uh, amplitude of the leg motions on the left or the right side, depending on where the target was for the creature in the game and the target for the game uh, was set by the game rules so it wasn't the creature being clever enough to know what it needs to do next it was actually the rules were <laughs> oh sorry Paul <laughs> <laughs> the rules were sort of like defined by by the game and then the uh, creatures were told right well done you've got to this point now you've got to get to this point and so that's why they they, they do some really clever stuff and they look a lot more intelligent than they are. But if you were to try and train agents to do that from now, it would take you, um, like you need a small server farm and, uh, and a few days of, uh, of high intense compute. Is that like the thing in terms of where it, would, where it would go now is actually the problem would just be, um, instead of trying to find a fix for it like that, i.e. a little, what sounds to me like a genius cheat, basically, to restrict the rules of the game so that it works and it looks right. Um, now, I imagine we'd be investing a lot more effort in trying to make these things autonomous intellectual creatures that had much more sensor input, and we'd be going to hear a pack out and asking for 20 million quid again. I don't think so, yeah, the original be... intention. Oh, it's a... I was just going to say, I don't think we would be needing to no. ask for 20 million quid. I, I think that the things that would change would be the problem. Um, you, you, you can disagree, actually, because I was fascinated by your answer, Dylan. So you, you need to finish that one. But just getting back to Callum's initial question, what would change? I, I, I would suspect that there was a certain sort of charm to the simplicity of the graphics and the simplicity of the studio environment in which the kids played in the first three series. And it was massively helped by the uh, the presenter, Jake Humphreys and the um, and Rich, who provided the um, sort of commentaries and so forth. But I think that that may not stack up now. So I think that there would be a, a um, big effort to be made to sort of hmm, improve on the sort of graphical look or perhaps on terrain features and 
ramp up what we could do with the simulated physics and make the make the challenges perhaps more visually challenging or interesting. But, but I don't think you would necessarily want to change a whole lot. No, I agree. And also, one could imagine piling a lot of money into kind of the wrong area. One of the things I think you would do is you wouldn't have to send out CD-ROMs with an eight megabyte download <laughs> on, uh, because because nowadays you could just send it over your phone. Whereas we, because it was eight megabytes, and that was too big for our audience. So a lot of which were using 56K modems. So we had to send them on CD-ROMs to children's home. So that's one thing we'd improve. This is where we get the chance to say, you know what, and you tell kids that today. Yeah. Nowadays you, could almost, nowadays you could almost make an iOS app that could Definitely. handle that level of data and stuff. It, the, that, that would be, the, I feel like, what what would be a main change from a user perspective. So it's, uh, but Bamzuki was UK only, of course, and uh, that would obviously change. I mean, there would be no reason why we wouldn't be able to access a global audience. Right, everybody, we're going to leave it there for this video, just because we talk about quite a bit, and we didn't really want to cut stuff out without making it a really long video. So we'll have a part two coming a bit later this week. Until then, don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment down below if you like what you're seeing. And of course, subscribe so you don't miss the next part. I'll see you then.